days, that will give you information about that, or you can always give us a call um, if you would like more information about that. But we hope that you can be a part of that, especially as we are gearing up uh, to the Easter season. Uh, but right now, I would like to introduce Elizabeth Gadd, who is the Chief Development Officer of what was formerly known as the Florida United Methodist Children's Home. She'll have a little bit more information about that, but also, most importantly, um, coming just to share a little bit about what is going on and how we continue to be a part of that. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Good morning, and thank you for having me. What a wonderful blessing to be here with you this morning. You know, you all are such a wonderful blessing to the children's home each and every day throughout the year. You give sacrificially through your gifts. You invest in us in different ways through your donations of in-kind goods and coming over and serving, and we cannot say thank you enough. And today, I have the distinct honor and privilege to come and say formally thank you, and not only thank you, but thank you for being a top 25 giving church again for 2023. Give yourself a round of applause. And at this time, I'd like to make a special presentation. In recognition and appreciation, this certificate is presented to... Lakeland First United Methodist Church in sincere appreciation for your giving and being a top 25 church for 2023. Would you like to know how much you gave? Yes. I'm glad you're sitting down. $85,013.12. Thank you so much for your leadership. We so greatly appreciate all that you do. And just very briefly, how does that tie into the life of a child? We had a girl come to us, and her name was Dulce. Unfortunately, Dulce's parental rights had been taken away, and she and her siblings were on a path to be adopted. And unfortunately, the adoptive parents said, we don't want Dulce. They only wanted the younger children. And so they turned Dulce back over. Imagine the hurt and despair that child had. But she came into our care, none too happy to be there, of course. But through her time that she was with us, she came to know Christ. Amen? Amen. And not only that, last November, her new adoption was finalized. She went from being hopeless to hopeful. And that is what we are there to do each and every day, thanks to you and your generosity. And as Pastor Andy shared, yesterday was a momentous day in the life of what was formerly known as the Florida United Methodist Children's Home. We are now known as Residing Hope. So I hope you will join us in living into this new name as we move forward. It has been a six-year journey, and we're super excited to embark upon this new journey as Residing Hope. Thank you all again, and God bless you. Elizabeth, thank you so much for that. And again, to thank this church uh, for continuing uh, so tirelessly to be a part of that. Um, for those who don't know, Jeff Michel is uh, one of our liaisons uh, to that ministry, as well as Sean Holtz, uh, who is part of uh, Neighborhood, is one of our directors. Um, I also encourage you to talk to our youth ministry, who has spent a lot of personal time over there, uh, just to hear more about what is going on. But as we continue to be connected, we thank you for your generosity. And it's stories like that that remind us um, that we are leading to that joy of resurrection, and that there is resurrection all around us. Um, it does not negate the hardship and challenge that we go through sometimes, but it always leads us to that greater joy. So as people who represent that greatest joy and who are part of the body of Christ, I invite us to stand now as we enter into this time of worship with our call to worship together. For we cry out to you, O God, waiting for you, hoping in your word. Hear our voice, for we call day and night. We trust in your steadfast love, so we will follow your way. Good morning. Let's do this, shall we? <laughs>
shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Let's make a hard to wake at the sound of Jesus' name.
that I invite us to share the peace of Christ with one another and a special greeting to those watching online but greet your neighbors friends
friends, as we move into this time of prayer, um, we know it is from this place as a church family that we care for one another, we hold one another in prayer, and so we do have one family. We uh, want to make sure that we lift up and continue to pray for them in their time of grief. So Joe Jefferson passed away on March 2nd at the age of 56. I know. So we want to make sure to continue to hold this family in our prayers, friends. He is survived by his mother, Susie, sister, Julie, daughters, Julie and Reagan, niece, Sarah, and nephew, Clayton. So we did celebrate his life here at the church on Wednesday, March 6th in our sanctuary. So again, we invite you to continue to be in prayer for this family during their time of grief. But friends, with today being St. Patrick's Day and this time of prayer, I will be bringing to us an abbreviated version of a prayer commonly known as St. Patrick's Breastplate and attributed to him and his ministry. But now, friends, let us unite our hearts and minds together in prayer. Let us pray. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me. Christ shield me today against wounding. Christ with me. Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in the eye that sees me, and Christ in the ear that hears me. And God, we do pray all of this together in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. And so now, friends, as we come into this time of offering, we know that we give back to God out of the great gratitude of all that God has first given us. And so we also take this time to celebrate all that's going on in the life and ministry of our church and what our generosity does. And so on this Sunday with Elizabeth here with us, what a wonderful time to recognize what our giving goes to do, not only in our church, but beyond. Through ministries like Residing Hope and others, we are extending our reach through the connection out throughout our state and even throughout our world. So thank you for the ways that our generosity really spreads God's love throughout our world. So during this time, ushers will be coming around with offering plates. You're welcome to give a physical gift that way. Or if you're worshiping online or prefer to give online, that link to give is firstumc.org slash give. But friends, however you choose to use this time, may we keep those grateful hearts focused on sharing God's love as we give back together.
believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Creo en el Espíritu Santo, la Santa Iglesia Universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. We're so glad that you're here on this St. Patrick's Day. I have about 30 pinch marks on my body today because I have a green tie in the other service, but I don't feel like wearing a tie. Besides, with this red hair, you know I'm Irish, so don't worry about it. I mean, it's there. It's obvious. But it's good to see everybody in worship today. We're so glad that you're here with us. And how about that praise team? Didn't they do a good job? For sure. Yeah. Let us be in an attitude of prayer together, please. Eternal God, thank you for the gift of this service each week. It, it stirs us and nourishes us and empowers us and inspires us. And for that, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that your Holy Spirit is alive and well in this place. And thank you for the way it guides us and empowers us. And now, Lord, you have granted to me the amazing privilege and responsibility of preaching your word to these, my friends, and your servants, Lord. It's a task. I can't do it on my own strength, Lord. I need you to make me equal to it. So, Lord, please speak to me and through me in such a way that all of us receive a word from you that will make a difference to our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're a Christian, do you have to go to church? Yes. All right, sermon over. <laughs> We're supposed to say that. No, no, that's good. No, no. <laughs> If you don't go to church, are you still a Christian? Yes. Well, this morning, I'm going to be answering those two questions as we continue in our series, We Believe, What Christians Believe and Why It Matters. And in this series, we're taking a closer look at the essential beliefs or some of the essential beliefs of our faith and seeing how they apply to our lives today. And of course, this week, we focus on that particular phrase in the Apostles' Creed, we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Let me address right off the bat a common question I get about that phrase. People say that and hear that, and they often ask me, Charlie, aren't we Protestants? Why are we saying Catholic? We're not Catholic. We're Methodists. We're Protestants. Well, if you look in your book of worship, and you look at the Apostles' Creed, you will find a little star by Catholic, little c, and it means universal, which means we believe in the universal body of Jesus Christ, which includes Roman Catholics, but it includes Protestants, all kinds of Methodists and Baptists and Lutherans and Presbyterians, any church that lifts up Jesus Christ as Lord and follows Jesus Christ. We believe in the holy, universal church of Jesus Christ. That's what we believe. And so to, to dig really deep in our belief in the church today, I want to come at it by answering a couple questions that maybe you get a lot, maybe you debate your friends a lot when it comes to this question. But the question is, if you're a Christian, do you have to go to church? And the answer is yes. Yes. If, if, if Jesus can, can raise from the dead, we can raise from the bed, right? <laughs> <laughs> now for the benediction, right? <laughs> well, I have a few more things to say, you know. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you must be, you must go to church. In fact, not only must you go to church and attend church, but you must be active in a church. If you want to be a growing, healthy Christian, you must go to church. Now, let me put it another way. Can you be a Christian and not go to church? Yeah, but not a very good one. <laughs> Can you be a member of a gym and never go? Yeah, a lot of people do that, but you'll never be healthy. 
You know, can you be married and avoid your spouse? Yes, but you won't be married for long. Amen. It's just the truth. Can you, can you be part of a team and, and skip practice? Heck yeah, but you're going to let the team down on gang day. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, being active in a church is simply not optional. Now, I realize this upsets some people. It's not the popular thing to say, and, and, it's, and it's usually more trendy to be casual about church attendance. But let me tell you, not everything I say up here, you're going to agree with. Sometimes you need to be stretched. And if, and if the truth is that the culture today likes pastors to be authentic, here's the authentic truth. If you're a Christian, you must go to church. If you want to grow as a Christian, you must go to church. You have to go to church. It's so important. So today, I am going to answer the question, why you must go to church? As I look at this belief and we look at this belief, and as I do it, I believe you're going to have a deeper appreciation for why you believe in the church and why going to church is so essential for Christians. And most of all, in this message, I'm going to help equip you, talk to people who ask the questions about church, who say, I don't have to go to church. You will have excellent information to give them. For I realize I'm preaching to the choir today. Amen? Amen. You're here. You got out of bed. You did everything. So in many ways, this message is for you to share. Now, before I get letters and emails and all kinds of stuff, let me say a few things, okay? First is this, by saying you must attend church, I am not saying that if you're not a Christian, you have to go to church. If, if you're of a different religion, you're not obligated to go to church. And if you're in that category today, welcome. You are always here. And I imagine you're going to get a deeper appreciation of the church of Jesus Christ through this message. Now, another thing I'm not saying today, when I say you must go to church, I am not saying that if you don't go to church, you're an evil, bad person, and you're going to lose your salvation. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that at all. And the third thing is this. I am not saying that worshiping online is bad. It's better than not worshiping at all, but I'm going to address that a little later in the message. How's that for a cliffhanger, huh? But... For now, hang on to your seats because I'm about to share with you why it's so important for us as Christians to attend church, to be active at a church. So you ready for this? I only have about 45 of them today. Okay, you ready for it? The first is this. Christianity is a team sport. Christianity is a team sport. Now, growing up in Atlanta, I was a real Braves fan. I'm still a Braves fan. To me, they're still America's team. And I love the Braves, and I played baseball, and I would, I would be in the backyard by myself pretending to be on the Braves, a pitcher for the Braves. And I would pretend and fantasize that I was pitching, and there, there would be this tennis ball in my glove, and I would throw things at this ch chimney, which was my imaginary catcher. And I would imagine it was the bottom of the ninth in the World Series, the last game. It was two outs, and I, I wound up, and I threw the ball, and it was a strike! And I yay, yay! And then I hugged my imaginary catcher, and my parents were looking out at me going, what is this crazy kid doing now? It was so much fun. It was so much fun pretending, but I wasn't playing baseball. I wasn't even practicing baseball. For me to realize my full potential as a baseball player, for me to realize what I was made of, I would have to join a real team and play on a real field and pitch to a real catcher, to a real batter, and have real coaches. And I would later, and it would make all the difference. The same thing is true for us as Christians, for us who follow Jesus Christ. For us to realize our full potential, we have to be on a team with other people living out our faith. And that's the only way we're going to see what we're made of. Every single growing, healthy Christian I know is active in a church. In fact, I challenge you. Here, you ready for this? I will give you $1,000, not out of the church account, out of my own account, 
for you to find me one person who is active and growing as a Christ follower who is not active in a local church. You can't find it. Christianity is not a spectator sport. It is a team sport. And God needs us on the field. God is counting on us. Uh, One of the reasons is each one of us in this room have gifts and skills and abilities that the church needs. And when we don't show up, when we're not active, we're depleting the church. We're denying the church of our skills and abilities to help transform the world for Jesus Christ. This is what the apostle Paul says. There are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. No one can make it clear. There is no such thing as an isolated Christian. Once you decide to follow Jesus Christ and you make him Lord and Savior, you're automatically grafted into the body of Jesus Christ. It's impossible to be separated from that. When you decided to be a Christian, you became a part of a big cosmic church of Jesus Christ, a big cosmic body. And you were given a position and you were given a jersey. You were given a place on the field. And God is counting on us. And when, when we don't show up, when we're not active, not only do we suffer, but the team suffers. We're part of a team. You know, I know a lot of parents who are obsessed with with, with sports and their kids. I, I get it. I have a kid. I love for him to play sports. He loves sports and we love sports. And you know, I talk to a lot of these parents and many times, even if their kid was bleeding to death, they would make practice. Get out of bed. I don't care if you're bleeding to death. I don't care if you're dying. You're not going to let down the team. Amen. Oh, I'm going to preach today. And yet, would we even consider letting down the body of Jesus Christ? So here's another one. Here we go. It's not about you. Can you say that with me? It's not about you. There you go. (laughs) Didn't know you're going to do it exactly right. That's good. You know, I I get exhausted sometimes by the way our consumer culture infiltrates the church and and influences the church. Some churches try to be a a carnival cruise liner, uh, trying to cater to every whim and fancy. And, and, And many times today, pastors, they're not trained to be spiritual leaders or prophets. They're trained to be entrepreneurs. And then we wonder why some churches are a mile wide and an inch deep. And thank God this is not one of those churches. And what I've noticed as a pastor over the years is that this consumer mentality often affects the way people shop for churches. Because some time ago, when when people were looking for churches, most of them would say, how can I serve this church? How can I use my gifts to help this church? How can I give to this church? But, But now more and more, I notice some people, when it comes to looking for churches, all kinds of churches, they will say, how can the church serve me? What can the church do for me? How can the church meet my every need? That is not the church. The church is, does not exist to please people. It exists to equip people to be disciples of Jesus Christ. I remember a, a lady coming to see me in another church I served who was interested in being part of the church. Love those meetings, at least most of them. And she came to see me. And I walked in, I'd never met her before, and she looked so proper, very proper. And she was interested in the church. And she said, well, I'm I'm leaving my current church, and I'm interested in yours. And I said, well, let me ask you, why are you leaving your church? And she said, I'm not being fed. They're not meeting my needs. And then she said, and I've watched you online, and you're not a bad preacher. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> and, and your church seems to be great. And so I thought I'd, I'd give you a try. This is great. And I said, that's wonderful. Let's talk about it. She says, but there's always a but. 
I have a few, and she said this, requirements? Oh, do tell. <laughs> and she proceeds to go, and this is true, gets in her purse, and she has this list. There is a list. All the way down, you need to preach from the King James Version. You, you, need, to, you need to preach these kinds of sermon on sin. You, you, you need to have this kind of curriculum for Sunday school, for children and adults, and on and on and on and on and on and on. And, when, and at the end, I, I said, well, anything else? And she said, yeah, the sanctuary should not be too cold. And I was so tempted. I was so very tempted, church, to give her the line from Burger King, your way right away. But the spirit prevailed. But what I did say, what I did tell her is what I've told you before, oftentimes when I run across those kinds of folks who think that they can find the perfect church. I looked at her, I looked at her, I said, listen, there's no such thing as the perfect church that can meet your every need. But, but let me tell you this, when, when you find the perfect church, and join it, it won't be perfect anymore, okay? <laughs> Needless to say, she didn't join the church, okay? You know, many folks treat church like free religious entertainment. You know, they'll go to this church for some worship and this church for a little Bible study and this church for VBS. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, but here's the problem. When crisis hits, when they want to go deeper, when their world has been turned upside down, they have no spiritual resources. They have no support system because they have not taken root in the church. They want to go to the show, but they don't want to grow. And that becomes a problem. The church is not a country club. It is not a religious resort. It is not a Disney cruise line, as wonderful as that is. We are the body of Jesus Christ charged with transforming lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yes, I believe in a, being appealing. Yes, yes, I believe in being relevant. Yes, I believe in meeting people where they are. Yes, I believe in good programming, but all of that serves the larger purpose of the church of Jesus Christ, being the body of Christ for the transformation of the world. So here's another one. Actually, let me read this text from Paul. He says this, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is Christ who lives in us. And let me tell you, we have a lot of work to do out there. There are so many people who need the light of Christ within us, who need the love of Christ within us. Here's the next one. The church shows us, and this is the truth, that God can use anybody. Amen? God can use anybody. We all know that the church is filled with imperfect people. I mean, it'll disappoint you. The church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites, and I am chief among them, which is why we're here, because we need a Savior. Raise your hand if you need a Savior. I need a Savior because we are screwed up, aren't we? We are messed up, and I need a Savior. I really do. And that's why I don't get when people say, well, I'm not going to church. They're filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And sometimes I say to them, where do you think hypocrites should go? <laughs> don't, don't they? Is, is this where they need to be? And then I say, and there's always room for one more, so come on and join me. <laughs> filled with a bunch of hypocrites, you know? This means the church, church people will disappoint you. They'll, they'll make you angry. They'll upset you. This means your pastors will upset you, will not meet your expectations all the time, will make mistakes. We will. We will screw up. I promise you that. And you may not always agree with the things I say. But here's the great thing about all of that together. It proves to us the amazing things that God can do through anybody. God can use anyone. I mean, I've seen God use the most unlikely people in the churches I've served to do the most unlikely things. I've seen God use drug addicts. I've seen God use convicts. I've seen God use prostitutes. I've seen God use people you just would not imagine. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. I mean, my gosh, God actually called me to preach. Now, this is a great proof of it. But the Bible is replete 
If you don't believe me, the Bible is replete with not so crazy people that God used. You want a list? That's what I prepared. So this is what you're going to get. You ready for this? Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses, was, Moses stuttered. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah was too young. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. That's how we say it in the South. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs, for goodness sakes. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep when they were praying. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced many times. Mary Magdalene was demon-possessed. Zacchaeus was too small. Timothy had an ulcer. Paul was a Christian killer. Oh, and Lazarus was dead. D-E-D, dead. <laughs> Just look at the Bible. It proves that God can use anybody. And I tell you this, one of the greatest proofs for me that, that God exists and that Jesus Christ is alive is that the church still exists. And the Spirit of God is working through us. I like how 2 Corinthians puts it. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults, and hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's also why the Bible says that we have this treasure in clay jars. We are earthen vessels. Why? To prove that the power doesn't come from us. The power comes from God. Amen. Here's the next one. And y'all know this. I'm preaching to the choir, but, but it bears repeating. Church goers will inspire you. Yes, church goers, they're not perfect. They mess up. We mess up. But I tell you, church folks will inspire you because the church is filled, and this church is filled with them. People with all these different experiences of faith who've done all these different things, and we can learn so much from them. They can stretch us, and they can inspire us. It, it is amazing. When I think of this church and all the inspiring people in this church, it is mind-boggling. And you tell me, what other institution in the world, what other place in the world, in this culture today, where can you come and be part of a place with people of all different ages, all different backgrounds, all different experiences? In our culture today, people like to huddle together with people who think like them, who are of the same age, who listen to the same music, who think just alike. But the church forces us to come and be stretched by all kinds of different people. And all kinds of different experiences. And let me tell you this, you can't get that experience watching online. Oh, here we go. <laughs> now, let me say something before I really get letters and emails, okay? Let me say these things, and I mean them. I'm so glad that we have the technology that we have. Yes. Especially those who are watching online. And I'm very much aware there are many, many people who have all kinds of circumstances, health reasons, other reasons, who can't worship in person. I am so glad, I'm so grateful that we have this online ministry. I'm also very aware that worshiping online is, is better than not worshiping at all. And I'm very much aware that the reality is we're in the post-COVID era as the church, which means the reality is there is in-person worship and there is online worship and that's the way it's going to be. And I'm also aware, and this is important, that our online presence is our handshake to the community. When people are looking for a church home, they look online, don't they? And they look at First Church. And that's why our online ministry should be the best it can be. Because they look at us and say, I want to be part of that church. I want to go to that church. But I also know this. There are many, many people who worship online, who can worship in person and should worship in person, but do not worship in person because they believe it's the same thing and it's not. It's like at home at Christmas time when you turn on that channel that shows a, 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 a roaring um, fireplace. If you go up to it, 
you're not going to feel any warmth. You're not going to feel anything. The difference between that and actually having a real fireplace. You can't serve from your sofa. You can't be part of the community of faith from your sofa. Christians, we, we, don't, we don't consume. We engage. We don't watch. We give. We serve. We encourage. We inspire. That's what we do. Yes, you can worship Jesus Christ anywhere. Yes, the Holy Spirit of God is everywhere. No, you don't need to be in this space or a sanctuary to worship God and Jesus Christ. But I tell you, there is one thing that we definitely need and should do. We need to be in worship with all kinds of different people from all kinds of different backgrounds who need us and we need them who can inspire us, and we can inspire them. And I tell you this, I don't know about you, but this is true for me. I need the church. One of the reasons is that I can't do this alone. I can't follow Jesus Christ alone. I need prayer. I need support. I need help. Am I the only one in here? What's more, and I know many of you know this, what's more is that there are special things that occur in person that can't happen when you're watching a screen. We need to shake one another's hands. This is my favorite part of the week is coming through this service and shaking your hands and hugging you. I look forward to it all week. We need to hug one another and embrace one another. We need to look one another in the eyes and say, are you okay? How was your week? And we need to see if, if we need to listen to them. If they're upset, that cannot happen looking at a screen. So those of you who are watching online and you know who you are, you, you've spoken to me, well, we, we, we need to get back. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we need to get back. Come back. You know you need to. You know you miss it. I mean, I was talking with a, with a guy recently in the church who told me about this. He's, he confessed to me, Pastor Charlie, we were one of those families. We thought, you know, it's so nice being in your PJs and, and eating Pop-Tarts and drinking coffee and watching you on the big screen. I'm like, yeah, I would love that too. I'd love to just preach in my pajamas. Well, I mean, that wouldn't be a good thing, but anyway. <laughs> but then he said, with tears in his eyes, he says, now we're back. And he said this. I did not realize how much I need those people. Here's another one. Churchgoers, they will comfort you. Yeah, there are annoying church people who will disappoint you, but I tell you this, there are many people in the church, and this church is filled with them, who will sit next to you in court when your child is up on drug charges will hold your hand when your spouse is in a coffin. He'll bring you soup when you have the flu. He will listen to you when you're angry and upset. And when your world is caving in on you, they'll be there and they will hug you and they'll tell you, everything's going to be all right because I have your back and Jesus has your back. If I had a hundred dollar bill for every time I heard from someone in this church who said, I don't know what I would do without First Church Lakeland. I don't know what I'd do without First Church. I don't know what I'd do without First Church. Harry, we could double our budget, okay? Here's the next one, the last one. I have a lot more, but y'all wouldn't sit through all of it. <laughs> the church will give you plenty of laughs, amen? Randy and I, when we were serving Pasadena, that's where we found out that we were pregnant with Paul. Actually, I don't like that phrase. Brandy was pregnant, you know. <laughs> she, she's the one that went through the, 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 the tough part, okay? But it was great. Imagine going, being, having that experience. This church just embraced us. It was so, such a special uh, experience. In fact, they threw us a big baby shower one time, and we're still finding diapers that we received from that baby shower. But there was this big baby shower, and one of the things that they did was that they asked children in the preschool and in the Sunday school uh, some questions and asked them to give us advice as parents. And one of the things they asked the kids was, um, where do babies come from? 
And there were a lot of answers, but there are three in particular that I remember. One was storks, you know, yeah. The second one was Publix. <laughs> but the last one I remember, I, I kid you not, it was there. Brandy can confirm it. Beer. That child was wise beyond his years. <laughs> I'm making a letter on that one. I don't know. Want to know the, the best reason to be active in a church as a Christian? The Bible commands it. Take a look at what Hebrews says. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. Church is not optional for us as followers of Jesus Christ. We are the church. We're part of the church. We can't change that. But after hearing why today, why would you want it to be? So, I'll see you next Sunday. Let's pray. Great God, thank you for this church. We, many don't realize how blessed we are to be part of this church. Not only the Church Universal, but this particular church, Lord. Thank you for the ways in which this church reminds us of why it's so important. So Lord, indeed, by your Spirit, spur us on as we spur one another on to continue to be active and grow as part of your body. It's in Christ's name we pray.
you so much for worshiping with us today. We hope it's been a time of meaning, inspiration, of challenge for you. And again, we appreciate your presence. Receive this benediction. And now may that mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you also. May the love of God, our Heavenly Father, abide with you this day and throughout this week. May the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit fall fresh upon you. And the faith and fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ go with you and sustain you both now and forevermore. Amen.